Natasha. Debbie. Show. The show. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> Just two patriotic girls. Learning about the world. So please, don't take us the wrong way. When we woke up one year ago today, None of us had any idea that we would be losing Queen Elizabeth II. Queen Elizabeth the Great. Yeah. And it's surreal, really, that it's already been an entire year since Queen Elizabeth has left this world. And today, we wear black for one last time. I've always personally looked at a mourning period for myself and, and family as a year. Mm-hmm. And so that's how we will do this video today. We're gonna to do a tribute and a celebration of Queen Elizabeth II. We have our love for the military, of course, here at home and abroad with our allied nations. And we know Queen Elizabeth certainly, certainly had her love of the servicemen and women. What better tribute could we find than today's episode? And that is, Queen Elizabeth II, saluting the armed forces, commander-in-chief. And just a little blurb. I thought this was beautiful. The queen's relationship with the armed forces was a centerpiece of her reign. Mm -hmm. A special relationship forged in the dark days of the Second World War, and then as monarch, front and center of her duties as commander-in-chief. Firstly and foremost, as always, thank you to your service for all of those watching active duty military and veterans. Yes, thank you for your service. We have some more words to say at the end of this video. We're not gonna pause this video today. Um, so please stick with us at the end and um, we're gonna watch now and give tribute to Queen Elizabeth II on this one year after the passing of the world's most beloved queen. Buckingham Palace a place synonymous with the close ties between the British monarchy and the armed forces. It wasn't just the immaculately turned out palace guards which tourists flocked to see, but the Queen's household was full of serving and retired forces personnel who simply made the place tick. The Queen relied on them for a multitude of tasks from running the royal household to the flag sergeant, making sure the raising of the royal standard is timed to coincide with the exact moment the Queen passes through the palace gates. In private, the royal family referred to themselves as the firm, and throughout her long reign, the Queen performed her duties as head of state with a true sense of vocation, yeah. always conducted with exemplary dedication and energy. But if the House of Windsor could be said to have a profession, it was surely that of duty in the military. The Queen herself had served in uniform, as had her father, husband, sons and grandsons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Proud legacy. I mean, of course, the whole country looked up to the Queen for all sorts of reasons. Um, the whole world. Uh, her dedication, her length of service, all of these things. But I do think that the armed forces and the monarch have this absolutely unique relationship because it is to the monarch that the loyalty is owed. With her sister, Princess Margaret, she stepped ashore to join in an official visit to Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. It's where the 13-year-old was first to meet Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark, aged 18 and then an officer cadet. Official duties on behalf of her parents, the King and Queen, swiftly followed. This was her first solo public appearance. On her 16th birthday, she reviewed contingents of eight battalions of the Grenadier Guards at Windsor Castle. She was already their regimental colonel. I've never seen the any Queen of that shared a particular no. bond or with those that. like her who had put on uniform during the country's time of greatest peril. Huh. She was of that World War II generation. Mm -hmm. 
taking a driving course at a training center is Princess Elizabeth, second subaltern ATS. She has been learning to drive and maintain all types of motor vehicles. Honorary second subaltern Princess Elizabeth qualified as a driver and mechanic in the Auxiliary Territorial Service and was said to return home each evening to Buckingham Palace proudly showing off the grease beneath her fingernails <laughs> after a day spent working under the bonnet of a truck. It meant that when the war ended later that year, the princess could join in the nation's relief and celebration, knowing, like millions of others, she had not shirked from doing her bit. 1947 saw a rare glimpse of Princess Elizabeth having fun, enjoying some horseplay on the deck of HMS Vanguard <laughs> as the battleship took her on tour to South Africa. <laughs> it was in Cape Town that she recorded her 21st birthday radio broadcast in which she reflected on what her generation had just been through. I am thinking especially today of all the young men and women who were born about the same time as myself and have grown up like me in terrible and glorious years of the Second World War. That year, Britain, still in the grips of post-war austerity, was cheered up by the royal wedding. It was the start of a short period of her life as a service wife and mother. For a couple of years from 1949, Princess Elizabeth enjoyed being an ordinary Navy wife when Prince Philip was posted to Malta. I think when you see the photographs of her when she was first married to a sailor, Prince Philip, in Malta, it looked a very happy time. Mm -hmm. So I think that personal connection was, was, if you like, cemented then. And then, of course, the unfolding relationship with the armed forces that, that she's um, held so, so wonderfully. A most impressive fly past by jet aircraft. By 1951, with the king's health declining, she was taking on more duties in preparation for her succession. Here, presenting colors to the RAF presentation of the King's colour followed. It was the first to be presented to the Royal Air Force. Nineteen fifty two brought the death of her father, King George the Sixth, who served as a Royal Navy sub lieutenant in World War One's Battle of Jutland. And in the summer of the following year came the coronation, and what many hailed as the dawn of a new Elizabethan age. The succession also gave the military an opportunity to showcase its might for their new commander-in-chief. Along the lines of ships at anchor in the Solent, the frigate HMS Surprise was to pass in performance of her duty as royal yacht for the Queen. Much reduced since wartime, but far larger than today's forces. At Spithead, in the Solent, the coronation review of the fleet took place. A fleet then still a formidable force across the world's oceans. Absolutely. Her reign began as jet power was replacing propellers, so the Air Force showed how it was equipping for the Cold War at its coronation review at RAF Odium in Hampshire. Squadron leader Waterton in the Gloucester Javelin rent the sky at 575 miles an hour. Right from the start, the Queen took a real interest in these events. The Queen had a very special relationship with the armed forces based on a number of things. Firstly, she was a very warm, intelligent, person, uh -huh. interested in everybody. Secondly, mm -hmm. after all, her, hu her husband had fought in the Second World War, her father had been in the Navy in the First World War, she had been in the Women's Army Corps uh -huh. at the end of the Second World War, her son had fought exactly. in the Falkland Islands, and one of her grandsons mm -hmm. had fought in Afghanistan, and the other uh, is a helicopter pilot. So she knows a great deal about the armed forces from the inside. Oh, yeah. 
And there's no point in ever trying to tell her something that is nonsense, because she'll spot it right away. <laughs> she was very, very much loved by uh, the soldiers, sailors and airmen, and everybody felt it was really special when the Queen came to visit them, because she took such an interest in what they were doing. And mm -hmm. one could tell her all sorts of things that you couldn't tell a lot of other people highly secret things that she was allowed to know <laughs> and she knew a great deal about what went on. For nothing you couldn't tell her, she didn't already know. Mm. One way the Queen kept in touch with the armed forces was by holding audiences with senior figures. Here, the incoming and outgoing colonels of the Royal Welsh arrive at the palace to meet the Queen. Her Majesty had been Colonel-in-Chief of their regiment since it was formed in 2006. The outgoing and incoming colonels, the Royal Welsh, Your Majesty. That's wow. Good morning, Philip Napier. Look at the smile on her face. And you're, you're just taking over at the moment, aren't you? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because so, you've done how long now? I've only done four and a half years. Four and a half years. It yes. seems to have flown by. I'm oh, sure, it's yes. Very, very, very great privilege to have been the Colonel Regiment of a very fine regiment. Very fine regiment. Which you know, indeed, you know yes. for very many years ago. Yes. And of course, protocol of. Which you know, indeed, you know yes. for very many years. I'm just going to pause. I lied and said we weren't, but I can't help mm -hmm. it. You look at her face, how lit up it is. You see the smile not just on her mouth, but in her uh -huh. eyes. That is woman. She's not faking. She's not acting. She cares. Yeah, she, she genuinely does. cares. You can see it on her head to toe. And we saw that on King Charles's face at the end of the coronation when mm -hmm. um, the military were in the back of Buckingham Palace. And uh, it's beautiful. It's it just is. beautiful. Yes. And of course, Protocol demands that um, uh, uh, we do not reveal the conversations, but you rest assured that the Queen took enormous interest uh, in the state of uh, her armed forces, and well informed. My goodness, yes, you um, you wouldn't want to go into the room ill prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Clark, the worshipful company of Saddlers. Saddlers, oh right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one might be quite interesting. Well, I, li I like horses. Ah, <laughs> so it's well, that's proven, good. proven to be excellent. Indeed. What you could be certain of is that the Queen was extremely well informed. Uh, you are not going to, in any way, uh, I think, surprise her. <laughs> and you wanted to make certain that she did not surprise you. No, I was going to say. <laughs> the Queen combined one-to-one -one audiences with royal reviews of military formations on a grand scale, which became a regular feature of the Buckingham Palace diary from her early days as monarch. 27th of March, 1969. The front parade, Woolwich. The visit of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Captain General, to her Royal Regiment of Artillery. The style of coverage may have become less formal with the passing of the years, but the Queen continued to spend time among her forces as long as her health allowed. She listened to their concerns, raised them privately, and on rare occasions, voiced them publicly. Yeah. In 1977, during her Silver Jubilee review of the RAF, when the revolutionary Harrier jump jet mm. headlined as the latest addition to Britain's military hardware, her speech referred to what then as now was a worry, reducing numbers and the spiralling cost of defence equipment. Mm. Ever since the Allied victories in 1945, to which the Royal Air Force made such conspicuous contributions, the development of military aviation has been remarkable. Unfortunately, the rise in costs has been equally remarkable. Mm. At the coronation review at Odium, 640 aircraft took part. Today, we shall see 137 in the air. 
but their collective capabilities far surpass those of 24 years ago. But it was an unexpected conflict breaking out on the other side of the world that saw British forces, Falklands. including her second son, Prince Andrew, fighting overseas. While he took part in the South Atlantic campaign as a Royal Navy helicopter pilot, she shared the anxiety being felt by thousands of other military families. Uh. It must have been a very scary time for her during the Falklands when Prince Andrew was, was down there. But you... We heard a lot about Simon Weston mm -hmm. on Facebook from our friends who told us to find a video, and I have not been able to find one. Um, mm. I just know that he was in, of course, as it says on the screen, right. a veteran, um, and he was severely you know, injured, of uh -huh. course, in the, the war. So um, it's something we're still looking for actively. Take it all those years forward <laughs> when she had to watch her grandson go into a war zone. Um, and, and you have to say all credit to both the lads for doing and wanting to do their duty. Mm -hmm. In 1993, the Queen helped the RAF celebrate its 75th anniversary at a parade at RAF Marham in Norfolk. Such a keynote event took months, if not years, of planning. Wow. But whatever lay in store, they could be sure the Queen wouldn't be phased. She had done it all before. Look at, the, look at this, look, look. Sure, the Queen... Look at the way she's walking, like... She is paying attention to every little thing. She yeah, is, she's actually inspecting. <laughs> she is not just standing there going, okay, yeah, whatever. No. No. I mean, that is a woman on a mission mm -hmm. who knows what to look for. <laughs> yep. It's just, it's actually quite intimidating, and I, I would not be able to stand there. <laughs> no, I, I would definitely be, like, sweating as she walked by. I'm like, sure they do I have her, everything but... right? <laughs> right? Queen wouldn't be phased. She had done it all before. Mm -hmm. We had a, a new standard, we had to deal with all of that. We were actually engaged in um, uh, some operations in the Middle East at the same time. In fact, the, the press seemed more interested in the operations in the Middle East than mm. our 75th anniversary, as I recall from, mm. from the interviews. Most of you will have seen in recent years dramatic changes in your day-to-day -day lives and in the role demanded of your service. In the 75 years since its formation, the Royal Air Force has time and time again demonstrated its ability to adapt and to respond quickly and effectively to changing circumstances. The hallmark of her official engagements, such as in 1999, when she presented new colors to the Coldstream Guards, was that however many parades she inspected, However many salutes she took, the Queen always made those taking part feel that they were special to her. Wherever you are, your colours will remain the symbol of my trust in you. And I know that you will maintain your loyalty to me and to our country. When you're actually there doing it, it um, the actual parade itself, it's, you, you do feel a, a sort of like emotion because obviously it's part of your battalion, it's part of the history, so there's quite a, um, a lot of mixed emotion between the, uh, the ranks when you're actually standing there. 2002, the year of her Golden Jubilee, saw the Queen in Portsmouth, where a display of simulated war fighting was laid on by the combined services to mark the first half century oh. of her reign. In return, she spoke of her appreciation for all that they did. Wow. I am only too well aware of the tremendous contribution that the armed forces, including the volunteer reserves, have made to the standing and reputation of this country throughout the world during my reign. I would like to mention at this time the men and women of all three services engaged in the campaign against international terrorism particularly those involved in operations in Afghanistan or deployed at sea in the region. Yeah. So today, I would like to thank all of you for your part in defending Britain 
and preserving peace around the world. I cannot think of a worthier task. The day concluded with one of the strangest delivered tributes she can ever have received, when a wet-suited military diver came ashore, James Bond style, to present the sovereign with a sopping wet bouquet. <laughs> That's awesome. Your Majesty, some flowers from your armed forces. <laughs> How cool is that? The dignity she demonstrated at all times meant she rarely showed emotion. But at 2002's Golden Jubilee Parade in the gardens of Buckingham Palace, where, for the first time, the historic units who made up the Sovereign's ceremonial bodyguard paraded together, she seemed to have a lump in her throat as she gazed across at those who, despite their age, mm -hmm. would literally lay down their lives for her. Mm. Mm. Visiting Plymouth that year, when she boarded HMS Ocean to present new colours to the Royal Navy, she highlighted in her speech how personal experience had bound monarchy and military together. And I would like to express my sympathy once again to the families and friends of those who have recently given their lives on active service. As a daughter, wife and mother of naval officers, I want to pay my tribute to the families for the support they give to those who are serving far from home. In 2006, the Queen saw the next generation of her family step forward for military service. She looked on with a grandmother's pride at Prince William's passing out parade at Sandhurst. Her delight, perhaps tempered by her foreknowledge that his brother, Prince Harry, already commissioned in the Blues and Royals, was destined for duty in Afghanistan the following year, the first of his two operational tours in Helmand. As Prince William later trained to become a search and rescue pilot, uh -huh. the Queen called in on him in 2011 to get a personal update on his progress at RAF Valley. With such a close family involvement, the Queen keenly felt the pain of those who had lost loved ones in the military. Yeah. So in 2009, she authorised the creation of a new medal in her name. I didn't know this. And so I have asked that this emblem should be known as the Elizabeth Cross. This seems to me a right and proper way of showing our enduring debt to those who are killed while actively wow. protecting what is most dear to us all. The solemn dignity which we attach to the names of those who have fallen is deeply ingrained in our national character. As a people, we accord this ultimate sacrifice the highest honour and respect. Mm. The Elizabeth Cross is still presented to those whose loved ones have died in operations or by terrorism. One of the first to receive the award from the Queen herself was the widow of trooper Christine Turton, killed in Iraq. She knew that my husband was killed alongside Corporal Ben Leaning in the same vehicle in Iraq. Um, so that was really, she'd either done some research or she knew about it, but that made it really special because then to her, Chris was a person as well. He wasn't just another soldier that was lost, he was a person, she knew something about him. So Trouble that made it really special, yeah. Very comfortable with the armed services because um, of her background, her own personal experiences and her knowledge of the loyalty, uh, the commitment uh, mm -hmm. that is part and parcel of the whole of the ethos of the armed services. And uh, in that sense, we haven't changed. Um, it's always been there. One hopes it always will be. Mm -hmm. In 2014, the Queen performed a duty very much rooted in the present and the future she launched the first of Britain's new supercarriers. Lord Mountbatten told my father on becoming king that there is no more fitting preparation to be king than to have been trained in the Royal Navy. <laughs> my own personal associations, especially as the proud sponsor of six other warships and submarines, remind me that that reputation for excellence continues to this day. Mm -hmm. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth. May God bless her and all who sail in her.
HMS Queen Elizabeth, a symbol of Britain's military prowess, whose name links today's forces with a monarch who has revered their service and sacrifice for many decades. Well said. Well said. 2014 will be remembered as the year the British combat mission in Afghanistan finally came to an end. In terms of longevity, it outlasted both the First and Second World Wars put together. Yeah. The mood was quite different for the Queen's 90th birthday, which saw a special day of celebration across the UK. It went without saying that the armed forces were heavily involved in the festivities, not only in Windsor, where the Queen greeted the crowds, but also with gun salutes <laughs> in the four corners of the country. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Mr Alan Spencer and his daughter Charlotte. Her Majesty, in her later years, may not have been seen as regularly on the parade square, but she still took the welfare of veterans and their families very seriously. This was a trip to the Hague Housing Trust in Surrey to see new and affordable homes that were built for veterans. Her Majesty has been our patron since uh, she became queen, in fact, came to some of our homes to open them as Princess Elizabeth in Jersey 70 years ago. So to have her back, uh, to show her what we've been doing, to be able to explain, and for her to meet people who made it happen, but also meet people who are going to live in the homes was in what is just so special. Sorry, i never heard of this before. Mm -mm. I, I want to see if we can learn more about this. I didn't know that existed. That's amazing. And, and this, she's a patron since she became queen. Mm -hmm. And didn't he just say have her back 70 years later so that she could see what they've been doing? I, I actually don't know. I thought that's what that. he said. Thank you. 70 years ago. So to have her back, uh, to show her what we've been doing, to be able to explain, for her to meet people who made it happen, but also meet people who are going to live in the homes was in what is just so special. As Her Majesty reached the twilight of her reign, not even she could have predicted how Britain would be confronted by an unseen enemy that threatened our lives, livelihoods and economy. Thousands of forces personnel answered their country's calling to support the nation's campaign against the COVID-19 virus. Millions of viewers tuned in to hear the Queen's message of reassurance. While we have faced challenges before, this one... We have never heard this. I don't know if they'll play the whole thing, probably not, but still, never heard it. ...of reassurance. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavour, using the great advances of science and our instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. The coronavirus pandemic produced incredible stories of human endeavour and amazing acts of kindness. The NHS fundraising efforts of Captain Tom Moore, a 100-year-old veteran, made him a national hero and just about the only member of the public to come face to face with the Queen during the pandemic. And that was to receive his knighthood. I'm in love right now. At Remembrance Time in 2020, the Queen wore a face mask in public for the first time as she made a poignant pilgrimage to the grave of the unknown warrior at Westminster Abbey to mark the centenary of his burial. Your Majesty, on Armistice Day, we will mark 100 years since the burial of the unknown warrior. After the Queen touched her bouquet, her equerry laid it on a corner of the grave. Ah. Wow. To know Queen Elizabeth is to love Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. So true. In 2021, the Queen and the nation lost the person whom she described as her strength and stay. The Duke of Edinburgh had been admitted to hospital on the 16th of February, and his treatment took a whole month, which included a heart procedure at St Bartholomew's Hospital. He returned to Windsor Castle, but died on the 9th of April, 
two months before his 100th birthday. The armed forces played a key role in his funeral at St George's Chapel, which was restricted by the pandemic. Many I newspapers highlighted mm -hmm. the monarch's dignity and stoicism as she mourned her husband at a distance from the rest of the family. It's so not fair. But despite her loss, the Queen continued with her work as sovereign. Just a few weeks later, she flew onto Royal Navy flagship HMS Queen Elizabeth to wish the ship's company well as they prepared to embark for the Far East on Britain's first carrier strike deployment in 11 years. She took the chance to meet some of the 1,700 personnel on board the carrier, which included a detachment of 250 from the United States. Yes! It was another of those moments when Her Majesty gave a glimpse of her continued commitment to her armed forces, a commitment that began on her 16th birthday and endured for decades. Twenty twenty two, and the nation's love for Her Majesty the Queen was never louder or clearer as she celebrated her platinum jubilee. So true. An astonishing record breaking reign. This appearance on that palace balcony was a welcoming reassurance for a nation so long under her reign. Her increasingly fragile health and mobility issues had already seen the Prince of Wales replace her at Troop in the Colour and she was forced to turn to the television to watch a star-studded Jubilee concert in her honour and even the Epsom Derby. It was clear she was deeply touched by the affection of the nation she had served for so long. For generations of Elizabethans, the world will never be the same. And sure. for the armed forces who honoured her long reign, there will never be a commander-in-chief quite like her. Nope. That was um, beautiful. Saw a lot there um, mm -hmm. we haven't seen before and learned some, some things we hadn't known about. Um, and then got me. <laughs> got me too. <laughs> beautiful woman, uh, amazing woman, amazing leader. <sighs> um, the world was a better place with her in it. Um, and yet, now that she is no longer here, um, <clears throat> we have to take responsibility of her legacy and help it to live on, share it with others. Um, she left so much for us, the whole world, um, to learn from her. And it's, it's easy for those left behind, any anytime you lose someone you love, you cherish a family member, a friend, to grieve, and she famously said it too, you know, grief is the price you pay for love, but that grief, that's ours, those left behind, right? Right. But, you know, if we take the legacy she left us, the world could be a whole different, amazing, incredible place. She gave a lot of lessons, life lessons to learn. She did? And uh, now it's up to all of us to take those lessons and put them into practice. Appreciate the military. Say thank you and thank you for your service. And you, you'll thank be watching. You. Um, and just love each other and, uh, you know, be with our families, care about our families, care about our fellow person. She just left so much, such a legacy. God bless her. And um, 
I'm very thankful that we've got to learn about her. Absolutely. Well said, Natasha. She was a great woman, and if we can only live our lives the way she did, think of how much better everything could be. So on this one-year anniversary of the passing of Elizabeth the Great, we don't forget her. We say those words, don't forget, but the thing is, put it into practice, we don't forget her. And there are ways in every day of our lives and moments that we can always show that, you know? And the way that her eyes smiled when she was listening to not just military, but anyone that she was really seeming to talk to, right. you know? We can be kinder to each other. And with that, we thank you. So, our hearts hurt for Queen Elizabeth II for being gone, but our lives are enriched by her being here. God bless her legacy. God save the king. God save the king. We'll see you next time. Love like Jess. Be as strong as Tyson. Bye. Bye.